Can you hear me good? Okay. Well, welcome, welcome everyone to St. Paul's to the Tippy McMichael lecture. Right up here. Okay. Okay. Um, my name is Denise Greathouse, and I want to tell you a little bit about Tippy McMichael before we start. Uh, Tippy's full name was Clifton Reed McMichael, and she was a lifelong member of St. Paul's Episcopal Church. She followed in the tradition of her family, was, who was a pioneering family of Fayetteville, and they were also members of St. Paul's Church in the 19th century. As a young girl, Tippy contracted polio, and therefore she... <laughs> My daughter is recording me. Uh, <laughs> uh, she contracted polio, therefore she had to rely on crutches or a wheelchair to get around. She graduated from the University of Arkansas in 1939, and unusual for a woman of that time period, she had a full-time professional career. During World War II, she worked at Fort Chaffee, and later she had an executive position at U.S. Steel in um, St. Louis. She's remembered as a feisty, strong-willed woman of independent mind, so I think I would have liked Tippy. At her death, she left a bequest of one-third of her estate which was approximately $1.5 million, to enhance the life and the work of the church. The Tippy McMichael Lecture Series was created from her gift as an expression of thanksgiving and a memorial to her. The series is funded from St. Paul's Permanent Endowment Fund, and additional support is provided by occasional donations from parishioners and friends of St. Paul's. The lecture series are an offering to the community from which St. Paul's draws its life. They are intended to explore a wide range of spiritual issues and feature accomplished speakers from varied disciplines and different religious traditions. So tonight we are extremely honored to have Principal Chief Jeffrey Standing Bear of the Osage Nation as our guest and our speaker. And he is from Pahuska, Oklahoma, which is a neighboring state, so he's our neighbor. And now I'd like to turn it over to our rector, Evan Gardner, to uh, introduce the chief. Thank you. Before I do that, let's again say thank you to the St. Spatula's Guild for hosting this wonderful reception. And I also want to say thank you to Denise and to our Tippy McMichael committee, who are responsible not only for uh, tonight, but also for having a vision for inviting gifted speakers who can share of their experience and their wisdom, not only with our parish, but with the community. Many of you are not a part of this church, but you're here, and I'm really glad that you know this is an offering that we hope uh, many will take advantage of. We're also grateful that those online are able to join us, uh, too. Thank you. Um, St. Paul's does not have uh, yet a history of making a land acknowledgement at the beginning of our services or gatherings, but we have a group at St. Paul's that has been doing some work on the subject of sacred ground. If you've been a part of the sacred ground group, would you raise your hand? I just want to say, yeah, wonderful. They meet weekly to talk about what does it mean to respect the history of this land and to recognize that how we use our land and how we receive our land is a reflection of who we are. And today at lunch, in a conversation that we shared, not only with Chief Standing Bear, but with a couple of other Native American leaders in this community, uh, they invited us to acknowledge that we're on land that belonged to other people before we got here, and that it's a diverse group of other people who were here. But a, a land acknowledgement, a statement, cannot be the end of our work, but the beginning of our work. And I hope that today's lecture and the conversations that arise from it will help us recognize and engage those Native peoples who have been in this area and who still are in this area. And I think you'll hear a lot about that today from Chief Standing Bear. Uh, I got to spend a little bit of time with the Chief today, and I learned a lot. One of the things I learned among uh, those at the table today is that Bentonville used to be called Osage. That was the name of that community before it was Bentonville, which will tell you something about the history of this place. I also heard today uh, Chief Standing Bear name that part of his work is to uh, celebrate, uh, to educate, and to advocate for the culture and history of his people, the Osage Nation. But I also heard him describe that the principal way he does that 
is by getting people together. Getting people together who can solve problems and share stories. I heard a little bit about the Harvest Center, about, uh, about a cattle processing facility, all of which are recent additions to the Osage Nation and a commitment to feeding uh, the Osage people, but also others, a commitment to the importance of nutrition. Um, I heard him speak generously and affectionately, not only about the Osage people, but about other native peoples and their relationships, even with, uh, with, uh, with groups I'd not uh, known about. I heard stories and histories uh, that you probably wouldn't read in a book, but they're the stories of a people. And Chief Standing Bear was gracious to share that with me today. And I look forward to hearing what he will share with us. When we uh, scheduled Chief Standing Bear to come here, we actually didn't recognize that the film, Killers of the Flower Moon, was about to premiere. And I'm really glad that he agreed to come here before he knew how busy his schedule would become <laughs> over these last few weeks. California yesterday, Mexico City earlier, he's been to Cannes for the film festival. There's a lot of attention being given to this particular story. But today we have a chance not only to hear about that, but to celebrate uh, what Chief Standing Bear will share with us. Join me in welcoming Principal Chief Jeffrey Standing Bear. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much for that introduction. And it's a real pleasure and honor to, uh, to be here and represent uh, my Osage people. Uh, my name is uh, Jeffrey Standing Bear. But my Osage name is Jinga Kahika, which means the child chief. And we have clans, and so I'm of the Bear Clan. And uh, Evan mentioned uh, some of the other tribes on a land acknowledgement. At the table, there was a Cherokee, and uh, he was pointing out the Cherokees were here. And we kept talking about the Quapaw. And even you can go back further to the uh, Wichita and Caddo. So there's been a variety of people that have called this area home. The Osage uh, historically have uh, claimed it uh, perhaps longer than any. The Quapaw were Osages. Uh, they decided uh, to go uh, uh, their own way uh, about 500 years ago. There were five groups eventually. Uh, the Osage was the largest, the others being the Omaha and Indians and the uh, Ka Indians and the Ponca Indians. So, but we were always the largest and make sure everybody else knew that. <laughs> so there's reasons why they left, right? <laughs> so, see ya. <laughs> so, no, we have good relations with them. Many of our singers are uh, of Ponca uh, uh, descent and the Quapaw language program uh, Billy Proctor and their group uh, have been working on revitalization. It's almost identical uh, to the, uh, the Osage. So we still have a, a good relationship. But, uh, but as, we, uh, as I grew up, as we all uh, uh, conducted ourselves in our Osage ways, uh, it, it, it was somewhat surprising uh, on occasion to learn that uh, we really do live in our own isolated world in so many ways. And you, even though I went to school in Tulsa, uh, some 60 miles from our tribal headquarters, um, when we have our funeral services, uh, they last four days. And, uh, and we also have extended family systems. So our cousins and aunts and uncles and family, my second cousins, third cousins, fourth cousins, uh, we, we're supposed to know who they are. Uh, now, so when one of my great uncles would pass away, I, I'd go to the funeral and I remember telling the, my mom would set it up to so where I'd, I'd go to the funeral and then, oh, you know, a couple months later, another great uncle would pass away. And then I'd go to another four day ceremony and. I remember this one teacher said, how many uncles do you have? <laughs> and I was a kid, you know, and I said, well, I don't, I don't know, 50? <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's just, a, you know, an example to a young person of the, the difference. And you learn that as you, you go on. And as I went through my uh, education and uh, 
I always try to uh, keep one, like, like so many of us, one uh, half of me in that world who they believed um, uh, in the old ways, the old systems, and uh, learned English as a second language. And they were, they, a lot of them didn't have what you'd call an education, but they were some of the smartest people I've ever met. And they influenced all of us of my generation. As we went further and, and I became chief 10 years ago, I, I began to uh, try to understand how we could present ourselves uh, to strengthen ourselves and to interact with the world in ways and bring more modern management uh, systems in, start relationships with banks, um, and all the uh, elements of the modern world and keep that manageable and to set goals that are realistic and achievable uh, and to find out who wants to be on board and who doesn't. Um, and as I did that, I, we, got, we traced our history and we wanted to basically go back through where we had been. And we had been in Kansas right before 1872 when we purchased our reservation again. It used to be our land. The federal government gave it to the Cherokee. We bought it from the Cherokee in 1872. And, and that uh, is where we live now. Uh, before that, before Kansas, we lived in Missouri for uh, a thousand years, some say, but hundreds and hundreds of years. And we lived here. And the, the treaties began in 1808, and, and it continued for uh, several um, uh, years after that, and just after the Lewis and Clark uh, expedition. And as we... Uh, gave up more and more of our land, we, and more people were coming in uh, from the east, and other tribes coming in from the east, f feeling pressure uh, over there, we became, like the other tribes, exposed to all the horrors of smallpox and uh, uh, measles and other diseases we had no resistance to. So although uh, we were never at war with the United States, uh, the loss of our life and culture was immense. My, my uh, uncle, uh, Ed Redigal, has uh, done a lot of research on that, and he, he has pointed out that evidence of 200,000 of us uh, lived um, here uh, in 1800, um, and then we've lost, they were, they were reduced to 2,000 uh, by 1890. So, so when you lose nine out of ten, and there's just a few of you staying around, it's, it's just impossible to uh, continue uh, so much. Uh, uh, and, and then and I have a little chance to sit down here. If you don't mind me all sitting back and visiting every now and then. <laughs> so uh, if, you, if you try to understand uh, why we lost so much, um, and how we uh, had to start grasping on to other uh, tribal ways to try to keep ourselves uh, going spiritually, uh, you'll, you'll see it's a direct result of, of those uh, being hit so hard. And then as we uh, continued uh, uh, in uh, our, our journey, uh, we, w the Osage seemed to have gotten lost, I think, in the popular mind uh, the Cherokee Nation is, is uh, today 460,000 people, and everybody knows about Cherokees. But Osage, we're just like 25,000 people. And uh, uh, we began to feel as we traced our, our journey back to Missouri and here uh, that you know, people just didn't know about us. And, uh, and I found that to be true, especially in 2017, as an example, when I was in Jeff City, Missouri, and working with the politicians and businessmen up there to pursue uh, tourism operations and perhaps a, a gaming casino operation up there for the Osage. And I was uh, having dinner uh, with some folks there in the capital, and 
this one man just polite, but he just looked disturbed and kept looking disturbed at me. And I kept thinking, you know, when you're trying to talk in business, you try, what am I saying that is, like right now, <laughs> what am I saying that's not making any sense? And uh, he got up, he, so he got up and just, you know, stood up, walked out. And I looked at the gentleman who would put this together, and I said, am I saying something wrong? And he goes, no, I'll tell you what it is. He goes, when he, he, he has a, a, a vacation home in Osage Beach. Uh, and at Osage Beach, uh, it's, there's all kinds of uh, references to Osage. It's Osage uh, uh, National Golf Course. There's the School of the Osage for their schools. And it goes on and on and on. And he's a, he's, a, he's a big shot down there and, uh, and uh, up in St. Louis, and he didn't know Osages still existed. And, and he, he's having a hard time coming to terms with that. And I just thought, let's explore that, because that, that's why I was there, to learn uh, what I could. And uh, gosh, I don't want to be flippant about it, but, but I'm going to be when I say I think he, he re- refers to us in his mind as like hobbits or elves or something. <laughs> that, I mean, really, and it, was a, it, it made him ill to, to uh, realize that we're still here. And we're just a couple of hours down the road. I mean, uh, and, and so I, I went back and explained this to our communications folks. And... Uh, they said, okay, this is what we've been talking about. Um, what should we do? So we have some uh, uh, campaigns, press campaigns, and one, one of them we started last year is We Are Not Relics. And uh, this, which is what I uh, wanted to uh, title tonight's uh, visit, um, and to explain to you how concerning it was and how real it is that people just think we're, we're gone, we are extinct, and we don't have a history. And I remember, we, don't, we never talked about this, this murder ring of rings, not just the one that's in the book and the movie, but the, all the others that occurred, even though that occurred during my grandparents' generation. Uh, my grandmother was born in 1900, so for those of you who read the book, and it, it's 1921 is when it, it, it starts, um, she was 21, and uh, she had a head right interest and all that, but, um, but uh, all that time uh, went by, we just stopped talking about it. It's pretty horrible, and so, uh, um, so we, didn't know, we didn't know that this movie was going to be um, uh, so strong, uh, as I've seen it a few times now, uh, helping out. Uh, with, with some of the Osage uh, input. Uh, so I'm kind of wondering uh, if, if that's still correct. I have to ask our communications department. Uh, okay, we may be relics today, still are, but after the 20th of uh, March, uh, uh, I don't know I don't know where this is going to go. So, uh, and it's not only here, but it's, uh, uh, as um, Evan said, I've been on a supporting the movie um, in other countries as well here in the last few weeks. And it, there is great interest worldwide uh, in, this, in this story. So, and we can talk about that more in a minute. Uh, but, um, so we still though uh, are trying to be really a, a wary of other people telling our story of uh, once we get it moving. We have to be very careful about this. Martin Scorsese, we'll talk about maybe in a minute, uh, understood that and did, was just great to work with on these people. But we are very concerned about people thinking uh, uh, we are so small now as a community uh, that our political voice and economic voice uh, is in competition with in Oklahoma with everyone else, including the, the very large, powerful tribes like the Cherokee and Muscogee Creek. So we're trying the best we can to uh, 
uh, uh, make people understand who we are. Now, <laughs> during the midst of that effort, and which will continue, uh, we have learned some lessons. And uh, as we looked out, and we, like I said, developed these relationships, uh, we were uh, hoping to take the best practices and take them in, we have. Uh, but uh, we uh, got a little off track, I think, uh, by concentrating so much of that, taking for granted uh, uh, certain basic items. Although we had our culture, we have our culture, our songs, our language, and we're very pleased about that, and we protect that. Uh, but what we didn't expect, and I don't think any of it, anybody in this room did, was that pandemic and COVID. And so during uh, these efforts and during uh, going up to Jeff City, going to Osage Beach, and trying to acquire land and you know, making the impact there and then uh, trying to uh, uh, do what we can for education and health and house, elderly housing particularly, and all those things that you're supposed to be doing for your people. We got hit with COVID and then on March 20 of 2020, when my top staff walked into my office and said, Chief, we have no meat. And I said, uh, well, go find someone else. Well, don't you think we'd already figured that out? <laughs> I go, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, I mean, my top staff are uh, uh, like former non-commissioned officers, like Chief Petty Officer and First Sergeant. And so they, these guys, these guys uh, really run the show, uh, so, and 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 so, uh, I said, well, uh, how, what's the situation? And if you remember, uh, we, the grocery stores were uh, without groceries for a while, and I had a couple of hundred children in preschool and and our immersion school to take care of, and in our elder programs, we try to get them two thousand calories a day on the uh, lunch. And uh, we have a lot of elders to take care of. And then, the, so to have them cut off of food and you're in charge is an experience that we're never going to have again. And that showed us we were too reliant on everyone else, which had got us in trouble in the first place uh, with when we hit oil and gas and and took it for granted that the money was there uh, only to lose it and so many of our lives uh, uh, because of our uh, false assumptions that someone else was going to take care of us, that we could trust people from the outside. And uh, we, we keep forgetting that lesson. Well, um, I've tried to make sure we're not going to ever forget that again. And how we do that is let's go ahead and fix it before it starts. So we were able to uh, uh, take the cattle we've had. We had 2,000 head of cattle. That's why I told my staff. I said, well, well go over there. and We've got 2,000 head of cattle five miles away. Go get some meat. And they said, well, you can't. You've got to get USDA processed and da 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 So uh, we learned that one. And uh, it took us eight to ten months to put a uh, meat processing plant in. And we can now process uh, 60 to 90 head of cattle, or we have 250 bison, uh, or the bison, and uh, we uh, are not going to run out of meat. I can tell you that. And uh, and then we put a uh, 40,000 square foot greenhouse and a 44,000 square foot uh, a vegetable and fruit processing and aquaponics farm, and uh, I'm real big. They're all, they all have backup generators. I'm real big on generators. Uh, and flashlights, too, if you want to. <laughs> if you want to know who I am, okay. <laughs> I'm really big on backup generators. We live in a place with a lot of storms, and flashlights are the best. Um, so um, so w w you know, we, we have learned, too, that uh, when they talk about sovereignty, maybe you heard that word when it comes to tribes. And, but I want to let you know, it's all governments have sovereign, sovereignty. All peoples have sovereignty. 
Uh, and that's, that, that's a, a word that has an external portion and an internal portion. The external portion is uh, like, a, like a wall for protection. The internal, it's about governing your own relationships. So we found out we need to develop those concepts and uh, we still rely on uh, external in partnerships with uh, local police, state, and local fire, and all any community would have. Uh, internally, though, that's where we were weak. And we still are. We're getting stronger. So with our food sovereignty, as we call it, we feel we're on the right track there. And then how do we make sure uh, that what you're going to see or what you learned about the killer of the flower moon um, will not happen again is through education. And we provide for our people who are now scattered throughout the, the United States, uh, any um, person of any age who is a member of, uh, becomes uh, enrolled in an accredited school, we will pay up 10 to 12,000 a year tuition and books uh, from our small gaming operations. We're pretty small. Uh, but we, we divert that money with a plan into the food sovereignty. So we take care of ourselves. Then we're, we're going into the uh, uh, higher education scholarships. And, um, and, and we'll have that money going in. And then uh, we have, we're still needing more for professional schools. But during all that, we've noticed that the labor markets have changed to where... Um, the people getting jobs are those that are graduating from getting certificates out of trade schools and uh, career tech, technical schools. So we were just barely funding those. So I started talking to uh, different business uh, women and men uh, about that trend, and I had the opportunity with this movie uh, to meet uh, more than once some of these uh, uh, folks from Apple, and I asked uh, Tim Cook, uh, about three months ago, um, I, what we were thinking about, about you know, beefing up that, and he said, uh, you're, you're on the right track. Uh, uh, we're get, we're uh, of the understanding, Apple, uh, that uh, the four, traditional four-year degrees uh, where people have invested for decades, and that's where the value is, um, is, is uh, now, at least in equal competition with the trade schools and those schools and that the value has shifting more and more and more over there and, uh, and that's where the people are getting the, the, the good jobs and uh, et, et cetera. I mean, I should have known I was asking the CEO of Apple, you know, what's, you know here's the, the big question and he essentially just said, follow the money. So... Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> but uh, that's what he's saying. So we're putting more money into that. And, and it's all about taking care of each other and being uh, uh, more self-sufficient. So we're starting with the basics. So we, we just restarted and said, okay, let's feed ourselves. Let's do that. Now let's look at our health systems. Let's look at housing. And what can we achieve? And it's so important that everybody, and I think everybody's getting that now. Uh, so we can, we can prepare for the inevitable uh, shortages and, uh, and we, do, we don't need to suffer uh, as we have before. Uh, I mean, really, if it can be avoided, it can be avoided. So I, this next generation coming up, uh, 30, 35, 40 or 45 year olds. I know I keep getting older at these 45, but even our, our 45 year olds are just relying on, on us still. And I keep, I keep telling them, we're dying off. <laughs> you know, and I'm kind of, I've been doing this, I was on our legislature for years before being chief. You know, I got two more years, and I think 12 years is enough, and I'm, I'm out of here. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, no, I'm not kidding. So, I, so I just go ahead and like this trip, I, as Evan said, I, you know, I said, told Apple, I want to go promote, promote my people. And uh, they said, well, you want to get on board? Because with the actor's strike, uh, uh, all the big stars cannot be in the promotion. And so they've asked uh, some Osages, and I said, let me go on there and do it. So, um, 
So I told Assistant Chief uh, uh, Walker, as a, I said, here's, here's your delegation of authority, and it's for two weeks. And our, and our legislature is in session for part of that, so good luck. And, <laughs> and also, uh, uh, don't be calling me too much. I don't want my cell phone bill overseas, you know, to go sky high. So uh, they're learning, they're learning, but they, th this next generation has got to step up. But I'm very, very pleased once they get the chance, they do really well. At least that's my experience. And, and then if you support them and give them the, the freedom to do things and they, they see the vision and other people uh, go after them and I say, look, that's just part of it. You have to understand that's just part of it. Getting criticized, uh, if, you, uh, if you don't do anything, you're not going to get criticized, okay? That's just how it works. You try to do something, you're going to get criticized. That's the, but to live and survive and be a leader, you've got to do something. And so that's just the way it works. And so, so they're stepping up. Uh, we're, we're not kidding. I don't know, over here, maybe your next generation is totally in. You guys don't have to worry about nothing. But, but where I am, uh, our people are, are just now, our young people grabbing hold of the, the control. And that's so much, again, our fault, because um, we grew up tough. It was hard, and I didn't want them to have to you know, go without like, uh, like I did and, and so many of my, my generation. Um, and we just went up, bent over backwards. Um, so now that's, that's it. Now it's your time. So that's where we are. We're picking uh, up these programs of education, health, housing, uh, and we are in security, we feel pretty good about that, uh, piece by piece. Now, how do we get our people back? I mentioned they're scattered all over the country. Of that 25,000 Osages, half don't even live in Oklahoma. Uh, there are thousands in Texas, thousands in California, all over the, all over the country, uh, back in our reservation hometown area, there's no more than 4,000 Osages, and that 4,000 tries to live our culture constantly. And people come back to, uh, Tulsa's not that far, uh, they come back a lot, but still with 10,000 people operating over 25,000, we've got to be very concerned about maintaining our culture and language. And, and that's what defines us, because Without your own language and your own culture, you're no different than anyone else, which is, which is not an insult to anyone else, believe it. I didn't mean it that way. But what I, what I do mean is, uh, let's see, one of our elders would always tell us when we were younger, uh, these other peoples have good ways, but we have good ways too. And so uh, all of our teachings, uh, uh, similar to the, to the Bible, the golden rule, our people say, uh, in Osage, they say, be good to one another. Uh, you know, all these teachings about keeping, looking to the future, um, like uh, it's a new day, and, and uh, et cetera. That's all our value system that we've kept through all these years from living here all the way, all the way through. The same words that were in those, those prayers that were said right here, um, are said today, uh, were in, in Pahuska, Harmony, and Gray Horse. And, and, and we're trying to keep those sounds, because we are a spiritual people, like I want to talk about tomorrow. Uh, we are a very spiritual people. Um, and as uh, we go on and on, we, we, we celebrate that uh, with each other. And we also uh, are very understanding about the diversity of how we choose to worship God. Um, it is, um, um, uh, we welcome Catholics, we welcome the, the Friends Church, the Osage Indian Baptist, the Native American Church, those who have the practice the old, old religion, um, all of that within our, our diverse community. But so we understand it's just how you choose to exercise that uh, petitions to, to, to God and, your, and, and how you, how you uh, treat each other. 
So, so those are all embedded in our language and our culture. And those of us that want to be Osage uh, are fighting for that. And, and so we found the best way to uh, really bring our people back is to take care of these basic needs, but also to work these future hopes through our children. And as is now obvious to us, uh, when you see that five-year-old child there, you're not only working on the present, you're working with 50 years in the future. That's the most efficient way to do things. And so as these children grow up uh, learning uh, uh, from TV, uh, English, and whatever else, and learning from the video games, and learning as they're growing up, uh, we've made sure uh, we try our best to use technology. Uh, we have uh, apps and keyboards. Uh, uh, they can text each other in our language. Uh, we have interactive uh, uh, use of the social media. Uh, we have... Um, um, communicating with NASA, the, the, the space station. Um, make it, we were spend time to, so they can talk to the astronauts as they go over. It takes a lot of work to arrange those things in months. Uh, and we go on and on and on. And so when we see um, at Thanksgiving, for example, um, when, when everyone prays, usually it's the oldest uh, man or woman that will say the prayer for everyone before the Thanksgiving. I've seen it as a work of our language instructors uh, for, for that eight or nine year old Osage child to stand in front of a, a gathering like this and say the prayer in Osage. And when you see that, because our language is, it was so endangered and it happened so fast. When you see that Osage child talking in Osage and, and that's, uh, that's us. Uh, I've seen tears come, come from uh, the people's eyes uh, when they see that. It's real. It's real. So we've turned, that, we've turned that around. And we were down to just a handful of fluent speakers. Um, and some say we lost them. But now we've got about 25 uh, adults that can uh, just about that far from fluent uh, because we have so many recordings of our people uh, who wanted to make sure um, w uh, this language wasn't lost. And those were done in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and we have the dictionaries of the Jesuit priests. Uh, we have, uh, we were in Kansas, and we also have the uh, other dictionaries uh, of other peoples. We, were, we have a lot of documentation, and these younger people have grabbed it. My job is to make sure they have support and we are carrying on our, our nation so we can be identified as Osage. So you can say, well, what tribe is that? And say, well, that's just an Indian. You say, no, it's not an Indian. That's an Osage. So be like the old folks used to be when someone asks you, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what tribe you are and, or whatever. They, they, they can explain it, but they can act it. So you will know, you know, who's a Navajo, who's a Pueblo, who's a Cherokee. You know, who's Muscogee Creek? Who's Quapaw and Osage? There's differences between Quapaw and Osage, even though we're essentially we're the same people, but they've developed separately. So we want you all to know who we are and, 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 and be your neighbor, but we're not going away. Uh, we, we are alive and well, and we're going to try to improve and get better and better. So that's... Um, that's a little bit about us. Uh, I've covered uh, pretty fast, and I it suggested I leave plenty of time for questions, and, and we can engage in a discussion uh, based on your questions. If not, I can pick up and talk about something else. Thank you. Denise and I both have a microphone, and if you'll raise your hand, we'll bring you the microphone. As you've heard, you kind of have to hold it right to your mouth, um, but just raise your hand, and we'll bring the microphone to you. Well, thank you for being here. You had mentioned health as one of your pillars for your culture, your community. How do you see your relationship with a, a huge entity called the Bureau of Indian Affairs 
health services. Yes. Um, and how does that how does that affect right, your people? Yeah. The Bureau of Indian Affairs has been in control of our property and was the leading entity to uh, recommend the legislation that set up the guardianship systems and the systems that, that uh, ended up being tools to remove our wealth from us and spread it otherwise. So the, 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 you know, how, how property was handled in probate, it led to uh, uh, such a loose system that mo motivated people to, to just start killing individuals so, they, so the survivors would inherit. Uh, that was a legal system. So, uh, you know, how to use it and access it is what became corrupted, too. Uh, I mean, uh, as part of it, uh, just, uh, just kill them. And, and then the, the judges and the, and the lawyers will take care legally of removing those uh, oil interests from that family group. But the health issues uh, uh, in the 1950s and 60s started shifting to the Indian Health Service in the public health system. And it is uh, not funded at a level to provide the uh, first-rate care that, that we all need. So, uh, so what we've been doing is taking, again, uh, the casino monies uh, and allocating it uh, to our employees, uh, uh, most, most who are Osage. So now we have no copay uh, and, and no uh, deductible, and it's first-rate. And for our elders, we have uh, anybody uh, uh, that applies, we'll have a, um, that's on Medicare, part, that pay your own Part B, uh, we will do, we pay a supplement, uh, for a supplement uh, that is uh, top of the line. And I mean, just top of the line. And we also have a Part D uh, prescription program. But for everyone that's not an elder and, or, and, and qualifies for that, those great programs, we have a, a $500, like a, it's a card that so you can do for incidentals. Uh, everybody gets 500 bucks. But that's still not enough because some of these uh, medical bills uh, come out. I've seen them one time, half a million, well, no, 250000 for one month's care for one person. And some of these uh, uh, drugs are just uh, unbelievable. So, um, so what we're doing is um, uh, right now actually uh, committing ourselves now that we've got these other things handled as to a, a successful growth rate, uh, we're putting all excess resources into the health of our people there in the old reservation. So uh, on my desk when I get back, Apparently, Assistant Chief uh, was going to say, well, this can wait till the Chief gets back on Monday, uh, is uh, for a uh, $50 million guarantee on a, on a loan that uh, I'll have to take to my legislature, uh, set them up and get that agenda uh, to build a new health clinic. And then we are, um, uh, uh, have, we are looking at more services in specialized areas and in, in bringing doctors up from Tulsa uh, who uh, uh, weekly, they don't have to be uh, there the whole time, but neurologists, uh, uh, women's medical, and, and others. You know, so we have, um, that's a management issue, and they're working that out real well. So, we're, so uh, and then we, we've got to handle, and we are, uh, the uh, issues of, which are related to health, uh, physical health, but the mental uh, issues uh, and emotional issues, the stress and anxiety, alcoholism, substance abuse. Uh, we have a new uh, uh, primary residential treatment program, so that would, uh, 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 women's, for women, they can stay there, and for men, and for juveniles. And, uh, and we'll, break, we'll do the ribbon cutting of that in August of 2024. So you know, finally taking on that, those issues of depression. And of course, we have the diabetes issues, which Native Americans have uh, more than others. And, uh, and, and that's related, I'm told, to the whole sugar issue. Uh, because alcoholism, which is still a serious, serious issue among us, 
and diabetes, I'm told, are based on uh, the sugar, effect of sugar on the metabolism, and that Native American had diets for thousands of years of, of lean meat and squash and vegetables and everything else that, that goes along with it, and have the Western diets come in, it just blew up the metabolisms. And so that didn't help when uh, measles, uh, 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 typhus, everything else happened. Uh, and then with processed foods coming out here in the last 70 years or 50 years, it's spreading to everyone. Everyone's getting that. So that's why we're regrouping our, our, our 200 uh, cattle, uh, 2,000 cattle, uh, I'm sorry, 2,000 uh, are uh, no, they're hormone free, all grass fed. And um, we, we're, we're, we, we understand it's all interconnected. But where we weren't attacking uh, with courage is these issues that every one of our extended family systems has uh, is the uh, stress, anxiety, uh, uh, alcoholism, drug abuse. Because uh, none of us are professionals in that. I mean, you can sit there and try to work it out with your loved one, and then, you know, as they go through, and of course they hurt themselves and they hurt those closest to them, right? That makes sense. You know, they hurt themselves, they'll hurt you, right? Uh, you know, and to, to see young people that you've known and you grow up who are leaders in our traditional community. I remember this uh, one man, and he was a drum keeper, a sacred drum keeper of one of our three districts. And he'd had his alcohol and, and other drug problems, but he got into heroin. And I told him, in front of people. Well, I used to practice law before I became a, a chief. And so I stood right in front of the judge and everybody else, and I'm not gonna give you his name, but I said, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna die, and you're gonna break your mother's heart. Right in front of the judge, everybody else. And the judge said, you, you listening to him? Uh, and sure enough, uh, he was dead six months, and it broke his mother's heart to this day. That was, that was like 12 years ago. And so, you know, we, we have a way to stop that if we find, we can find it, but it's going to take professionals. And then that way we can connect our culture, our sweat lodges and our cer ceremonies in with these uh, modern medicines and technology and with the use of the internet. Uh, and here's another issue. You know, you see, well, during the COVID, how was the internet? Everybody went to work from home. We didn't have internet. We didn't have internet. So what's the point of sending the kids back home to homeschool if they can't get on the internet? Because it doesn't exist. However, uh, we've gotten, uh, started working grants and trying to work this, uh, we learned how to do all that, and uh, we've received uh, $54 million in uh, put in the broadband infrastructure back home. That will bring people back. So our young people, uh, can uh, come back, and they don't have to go to Houston. They, you know, they don't have to go because they can access uh, the, the world through this new internet. And it's true what these experts are telling us, that uh, the, the civilization was built around rivers. And then after rivers, they were built around roads. And then after roads, it was built around railroads. And after railroads around highways, and they say, Chief, now they're going to be built where this internet is, where this uh, broadband, and I believe it. That's what we're doing. So we're building this infrastructure. We're in control of it. We're doing it. Uh, now, but the Bureau of Indian Affairs still is control of what's left of our oil and gas. And we have been working hard to change that. That's the Bureau of Indian Affairs, U.S. Department of Interior. The health is uh, uh, Department of, Depart U.S. Department of Health. But I'm, now we're working with USDA, which is my favorite federal agency now. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they are. They're great because they're about growth. They're about conservation. They're about sustainability. Uh, all these, which uh, we've learned, you have to do. You've got to take care of each other. And, and, and I like the way USDA can provide these, these uh, uh, services. But the Bureau of Indian Affairs used to be a bureau within the Department of Defense, what they call it the Department of War. And when they transferred that 
agency from the Department of War to the Department of Interior, it came with all the policies of military occupation. And so the, uh, our word for the agent, the superintendent of the Osage Indian Agency is Mahita. And when I said to the old folks, I said, why do we call the superintendent Long Knife? And the old folks said, well, because in our grandparents' time, the superintendent carried the sword. So, you know, I grew up with you know, that attitude, but the old folks were living in that world, uh, that uh, the Mahita. And they really believe that in that structure of that agency. So they try to, you try to pull them out, they say, well, you do that, what little you got left, we're going to tax it. It'll all become taxable, and, and they have all that. They always threaten you with that. Uh, and, um, and they still control your money. If you got that oil money, you got to go make application to the Bureau of Indian Affairs to, uh, to use it. Uh, can I have time to just tell them a little story about that, just real quick? Okay, so I'm in, I'm, I'm in uh, high school. And uh, I'm uh, uh, drive grandma's up there so she can get her, her every three months, the quarterly payment. She get her head right money. And, um, and she gets an allowance from the federal government. She gets an allowance. You know, so she was, uh, see, that was, she was probably 70 years old and raised a family. All that. She gets her al allowance of her money. And, and a little extra because uh, we needed a lawnmower. And so, uh, so we drove up there, and you had, you had to go up, make an you know, appointment for that day. And so we got there, and we went and talked to the Mahita. And, uh, and so I said, we need a new lawnmower. He, he, he interviewed about what, how big the yard was and all this stuff. And then, uh, then we said, we'll go across the hall and talk to the solicitor, the, the lawyer for the federal government, he would do essentially credit counseling and then ask about uh, the family and, you know, all nonsense, you know, stuff. And then we went down to the accounting. It took half a day. Then we ended up back up at the Mahida, the superintendent's office. And he says, uh, he goes, oh, yeah, okay, you cleared. All the, everything's checked off. And I'm sitting there with Grandma, and I'm just, you know, let's go. I need to get that lawnmower. And uh, he says... Uh, now hold on, I'll call down to the, to, the, to the hardware store. He picks up and he talks to his buddy and he goes, no, they don't need anything that big. No, they don't need anything that big. He goes, yeah, that's about right. And uh, okay, well, uh, her grandson's driving. Uh, and they'll come down and pick that up. And so he goes, she goes, okay, Mrs. Standing Bear, uh, you just go down uh, and they're gonna have that ready for you. And so I just like, okay, let's just get out of here. And so I uh, took Grandma down. We went down there, drove down in front of the hardware store. This man brought this big green Toro out. And I was pretty strong in those days, and like we all were, right? And so, so I, I opened the you know, tr you know, trunks were big in those, you know, big trunks. And it was a Buick, poor man's Cadillac, she said. Anyway, so uh, I got that uh, uh, and put it in there, tied it down, and off we go. I was driving back to Tulsa and I was thinking, there's got to be something wrong with this. This is my whole life. This is the way it's been. That's her money. And we just went in there and got permission. And we have no idea how much we paid for it because they're going to take it out of her accounts. They're going to do the accounting. There's something wrong with this system. And it's still that kind of control. And one, we've learned that control by the government is unhealthy and often fatal. It's because it could lead to what, you're, what you can read in that book, and you could, and you could read about, uh, or you can see what's in that movie. But um, David's book uh, was so well uh, uh, documented about you know, proving the murder uh, schemes as a result of the system, but he doesn't really have time to get into the system, and the movie doesn't get into it at all, really. Because what, what uh, Marty Scorsese says he does is he takes not the birth of the FBI and the Osage reign of terror as the uh, uh, content of the movie. He turns it into more 
uh, a personal relationship. You get to know the people involved that they talk about. You get to know Molly. You get to know Ernest. You get to know William Hale. And you learn uh, what Marty uh, Scorsese had said he wanted to do. You learn about, which is the best you can do in this situation of communications, you learn about trust uh, and betrayal of that trust, but you learn on two levels. The trust of, of Molly with Ernest and the betrayal of that trust, the most horrible betrayal, that she, he was murdering her sisters and probably her mother, and they had children. And she, he was, he was, and she was being poisoned. He was delivering the, the medicine, but he did love her. Twisted, as you'll see in there, it's twisted. And, and uh, that's Leonardo DiCaprio playing Ernest. And that's true. We all know, we, you know we, he got out of prison, he and his brother, Byron. They came back and lived among the Osage. And William Hale would still come through. I've talked to fellows, old timers, and they say, oh yeah, we knew him after he got out of prison. He'd come by and see if we needed to, any, any to steer or something for ceremonies. He'd have it slaughtered. Just, no, I didn't know. We were young, but, but then Marty says, uh, I then want to tell this story of betrayal and trust on a larger level. The trust of the Osage for the outside world and the betrayal of that trust. And that's where he could have gone further on the trust and betrayal about the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the federal government. But the movie's already three hours long. <laughs> so, uh, well, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a work of genius. He, he, he allowed us to tell our story, and his, the actors uh, worked so much with our language people. Robert De Niro, I tell my people, maybe we can talk as good Osage as he can. Because, <laughs> and Lily Gladstone, she's not Osage, but she, uh, she, she, she just said she worked four months uh, in, a, in an emergent environment with some of our speakers. And was, uh, but they, the Osage language is all throughout the movie. And uh, as one of the uh, uh, reporters asked a question the other day to him, to Scorsese, there's no subtitles when, a lot of times when people are talking. And uh, Scorsese goes, well, that's because uh, we realize when we do all these subtitles that people were watching the movie reading the movie. So, but if we did the, the scenes correctly, the way they wanted, people could understand what they're saying uh, without the subtitles. And so there are some here and there, but for most of the movie, you're hearing that Osage language spoke uh, without subtitles, because Leonardo DiCaprio, this is not the Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio you're used to seeing. This is a more a darker, uh, 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 not evil, he's kind of kind of goofy, naive. Uh, his uncle dominates, he comes back from World War I, this uh, 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 Leo DiCaprio with injuries, and he can't get a job except through his uncle, and he just comes part of that world. And then De Niro is uh, the, the the, the master and strong personality and Lily, but they're all talking Osage, and uh, and and my people worked with them day and night in front of the camera as extras. Uh, over a hundred of them were employed. Uh, we had a couple of young uh, Osage students that were in film school. They got to work behind with Rodrigo Pier Pireto, who was one of the top cinematographers in the world. He did. Uh, uh, he did, uh, there's a, well, he did all kinds of things. Right, right after uh, filming uh, um, Kill to the Fly Moon, the next day he went and uh, worked on, uh, did the cinematography for some movie I'm not going to watch called Barbie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but he's world famous when you go through this. So, so these two young Osages got to work with the world-class cinematographers, our people in our traditional clothing, working uh, with... Uh, Academy Award-winning costume designers, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. And so and some of the, these uh, uh, young ladies mostly uh, are, are going into the business and working with the business. There's a, there's a strike going on, so that's hurting the, the business. But uh, I know uh, uh, two of them that already got th jobs lined up in, in New Mexico uh, uh, in costume making 
and they're with at a world class level. And so, so we're looking forward to uh, the effects of all this, uh, but we want to make sure that as much as possible we're controlling this because we've had enough of other people controlling us. So if uh, I want to buy a lawnmower, what I do is I, I go find a way to buy a lawnmower. I don't go up and ask the superintendent. And, uh, you know, I mean, that you're considered sort of an upstart or something if you do that. And this isn't radical behavior for, I mean, I don't think it's radical. I, I just like to use my money to the federal government. Isn't that just bizarre? Well, that's the truth. And you don't really realize it's bizarre until you're away from it. And, because you, if you see it all the time, you take it for granted, which makes you think, what, what are you taking for granted today? Uh, I can tell you that uh, what I've seen control the federal government, I've seen elements of that out here. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for taking time with us tonight. Um, now that Deb Haaland is Interior Secretary, she's a Native American, uh, Pueblo, Laguna Pueblo from New Mexico. Have you seen differences now in how the Interior and the Bureau of Indian Affairs better, are run? I've seen better communications. Uh, she is head of, of Interior, the big, the big operation. So she has National Park Service. Uh, and you know, Bureau of Land Management, and over in the Bureau of Indian Affairs, that's uh, organized under an Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, and his name is Brian Newland. And he's a former tribal leader from up uh, near, uh, north and a former uh, uh, an attorney. Uh, he just doesn't have the, uh, and she doesn't either, uh, the time uh, or the political power to change this system. Uh, it has to be done in the United States Congress, but, but the, but, but, but the uh, administration needs to give a clear, simple plan, and the legislation needs to be developed concurrently with the administration, the executive branch, and the tribes. And, and, and so in case of the Osage, you cannot return a head right uh, that has been taken and lost because the federal laws make it practically impossible. It's impossible. So we need to get that law changed. But we have Congressman Lucas who's willing to sponsor that and explain it, uh, but it, it has to go through this, this morass uh, of that uh, of the executive branch and then once you get that plan, if that will ever happen, you take it to the U.S. Congress. And, and, and that is a mission that the next generation gets to handle. <laughs> so, so I know what needs to be done, but they're going to have to pick up and do it. I mean, that's, that's and you can go example to example to example. It takes partnerships, cooperation, takes uh, relentless uh, uh, pressure to keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Uh, uh, th but that's, that's what it takes. Otherwise, we're done. I mean, 100 years, Osage will be a relic. And I don't, I don't we're not going to do that on my watch. Time for one more? Thank you again for being here. My question is back to the movie. What do you hope that the general audiences take away from seeing it? it, it well, it, it's, <laughs> it's going to be different according to the audience. I have just learned that. Uh, the, the one that really surprised me was in Mexico uh, when the reporters said, uh, this story uh, is familiar to us. And I was like, well, yeah? And they said, uh, well, all the tribes in Mexico, and this is very similar with the, uh, uh, what, what had happened. And, and I, I, I told them I need to study that. So that's something I need to learn more about. Uh, then you get to, uh, 
we were able to go to London and uh, recently, and there the audience looks at it uh, more of an American, Americans did this, uh, Americans did that, the, the reporters I talked to. Then you come here, and uh, it's like, this is unbelievable. I just don't believe it. I see a lot of that, and uh, I said, well, it, it's true. It's true, and, and, and it, hap- it, it can happen again. It's still going on, and there's a lot of disbelief. Um, and then, then there's the view of the, na- the Osage audience, and uh, uh, the, Apple uh, gave us 800 of us to uh, invite us to a little reception, and they had five uh, theaters rented out, and uh, uh, a, gr- a lady, a uh, girl in her 20s, uh, she called it heavy. And I was like, well, when I was young, we used that. But then a, 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 woman, a woman that was uh, my age, she separate from the other side of the room, uh, came in and said, oh, hey, Terry. I said, what do you think of that? She goes, it was heavy. But they, they were using, they weren't using like heavy, man, or anything like that. They were saying it was just heavy. And, and then when you see it, and I've seen it more than once, but I've talked to other Osages that have seen it twice, and it's the depth of it. Uh, so to, and other Native Americans were in there as well uh, with us watching this. So I can tell you in that audience, it is, um, we knew it was a true story. We don't have to go through all that barriers. It was not a true story. We know it's a true story. And we just didn't talk about it until now. Uh, so, but you know, what is being said, what's being done, and that makes us co- have conversations among ourselves. And then, that's not a thing. For example, one of the uh, people who are victimized, their, their parents were part of that. She was telling people, uh, um, she told David Grand this too, I understand, that uh, when she goes to our ceremonies and sees all of our extended family systems or people, you know, big families uh, in dancing, these ceremonies, there, there are men there, the older men, that family, younger men, there'll be 30 40 of them on the big ones, the biggest families. And but others, you know, five, 10. And then they have camp and they have the, uh, all the women cooking and all that. When she goes to the dances, she sees all that. And she and her little family's there. She thinks, you know, my family should be like that family, should be big. But all, all my grandma and her sisters were murdered. And I never never looked at it that way, that when those small families show up, they're supposed to have been as big as our big families, but they were murdered, and their descendants never, got to, never were born. We've been talking about it. We've been talking about that kind of stuff. And we've learned a lot about generational trauma. And so we've, we've got these experts, just had, just had one two weeks ago talk to our Frontline staff that uh, do interviews for you know social services and stuff. Uh, we took them down to Tulsa, showed them the movie uh, for one day and talked to them the next day. These are psychologists, and they're talking to them about how do you, uh, Osages on the front line, uh, handle this from these families who are coming in for emergency services or whatever. Uh, and so it's caused a new awareness, and that movie is. Uh, what's really brought that uh, to our minds. So, so that's, uh, that's heavy. Let's say thank you to Chief Standing Bear. All right. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Before you leave, let me remind you of just a few things. We've got several opportunities to respond to Chief Standing Bear's presentation for further conversation. First, go see the film. It opens this coming weekend. I hope you'll go and see it. It also it will be streamed if you've got Apple TV. Second, as you'll see in the insert, we will have a parish book study during the month of November. You do need to sign up for that because space is limited, physical space is limited. And if we run out of space, then perhaps we'll have some spin-off book studies as well. 
The third opportunity is a field trip when we're going to head to Paul Huska and to that area to see um, some of the facilities and to continue our own reflection. So if you would like to be a part of that field trip, you can learn more about it at the book table. We're out of books, but you can head over there. We've got a handout to take for more details. Uh, come back tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock when Chief Standing Bear will be back to talk a little bit more about the Osage Nation, particularly their spirituality. And Denise, tell us, remind us what is ahead. Yeah, so we... We have a, a, another Tippy McMichael lecture, which will be February 24th and 25th. It's George Anthony Martin. Um, I don't know if some of you remember the film that was shown here, Master of Light. Did any of you come to that? Some of you did? Anyway, it's the, it was the character that the movie was about, and he he's now has a fine art studio in Atlanta. So he will be our next Tippy McMichael uh, speaker in February. Thank you all for being here, and I hope to see you tomorrow morning. Thank you so much.